Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to our worship service this evening as we continue our Lenten journey together. I suppose by now um, all of you have heard that we lost Sharon. Heaven gained her. She's in heaven with the Lord. But um, Elmer and her family and all of us, her church family, are sad and we miss her terribly. That funeral is Saturday at 11 o'clock and there will be a meal following. Okay, there will be a meal provided, just like we've done in the past. So, uh, also that precipitated some things at the meeting last night um, because of all this. And just a short explanation: for eight months now, your elders, I think, have done a fa fantastic job in trying to manage all this. But you know, one decision, and it came up last night at the at the council meeting: the elders are in charge of the doctrinal doctrine and practice of the church to make sure that we're in accord with the scriptures and Lutheran confessions and make sure services go off on time, all those things. And it was brought up at the meeting last night, why is this mask thing an elder's decision? And so it, with everything happening with Sharon's funeral and it was brought up at the council last night and the council last night decided that as of Sunday, masks are no longer mandatory. Okay. So it will be up to each individual to wear or not wear their mask as they see fit and follow their conscience and, and judgment. So I want to pass that on. And Elmer told me as far as the funeral goes, that's how he he wants to have that same option on, on Saturday for everybody at the funeral as well. So I'm passing that on to all of you. With that, obviously keeping the whole family in our prayers, um, we begin our service this evening by singing the first four stanzas of our opening hymn, hymn four, 420. The first four stanzas, we'll sing the last three at the end. And it'll be the same hymn. Christ the life of all the living.
We continue with the complaint service. O oh Lord Almighty, grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. sang a hymn after they had eaten the Passover meal and the Lord's Supper. Then they left the upper room and headed for the Mount of Olives, which was just outside the city of Jerusalem. It was already late at night. On the way, Jesus told his, told his disciples, This very night you will all be offended because of me. For the scriptures say, I will kill the shepherd, and his sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you into Galilee and meet you there. Peter answered, Even if all the others should fall away because of you, I will never fall away. But Jesus replied, Listen to what I tell you. This very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times, saying, You don't even know me. Even then, Peter confidently replied, even if I have to die with you, Lord, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples said the same thing. Jesus continued to walk along with his disciples. They crossed the brook Kidron and came to the Mount of Olives. One, on one of its slopes, there was an olive grove, a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus had often gone there in the past with his disciples when he wanted to be alone. Judas had also been there with Jesus many times before, so he knew the place well. As they reached the entrance, Jesus said to his disciples, Sit down here while I go ahead and pray. Pray that you will not fall into temptation. Then he took Peter, James, and John along with him and went farther into the garden. Great grief and anguish came over him. He told his disciples, My soul is so overwhelmed with sorrow. It's almost crushing me to death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Then he walked away from them, about as far as a man can throw a stone. He knelt down with his face to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Father, my father, he prayed, all things are possible for you. There is nothing you cannot do. Please take this terrible cup of suffering away from me, yet not what I want but what you want, not my will, but yours be done. Then he went back to the three disciples, but found them sleeping, exhausted from grief and sorrow. So he said to Peter, why are you asleep? 
Couldn't the three of you stay awake and watch with me for one hour? You must stay awake and keep praying so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the sinful flesh is weak. Then Jesus went away and prayed a second time, saying, O oh my Father, if it is not possible for me to get rid of this cup of suffering without drinking it, may your will be done. When Jesus returned, he found his disciples sleeping. They just couldn't keep their eyes open. They didn't know what to say in answer to his questions. So he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, praying the same prayer as before. An angel came from heaven to strengthen him, and as his agony grew worse, he prayed all the harder, and his sweat looked like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he came back to his disciples, he said to them, Are you going to go on sleeping the rest of the night? But look, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be betrayed into the hands of wicked men. Get up and get ready to go. Here comes the man who is going to betray me. Even while he was saying this, Judas arrived with a large crowd of men. Among them were Roman soldiers and men from the temple police force armed with swords and clubs. They also carried torches and lanterns with them so they could find their way in the night. They had been sent by the Jewish religious leaders, the chief priests and teachers of the law, the elders of the people, to arrest Jesus. Earlier, Judas had worked out a signal with the soldiers and the police. The man I kiss is the one you want. Grab him and hold him. So as soon as he had a chance, Judas walked up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Master, and kissed him. Friend, why have you come? Jesus asked him. Judas, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And since Jesus knew everything that was going to happen to him, he then turned to the crowd and asked, Who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. I am Jesus of Nazareth, the Savior replied. When Jesus said this to them, the men all backed away from him and fell to the ground. After they had struggled to their feet again, Jesus asked them once more, Who are you looking for? Once more they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you, Jesus said, I am Jesus. Then pointing to his disciples, he added, If you're looking for me, then let these men go on their way. He said this so that what had been said earlier that night would come true. I have not lost one of those that you have given me. Then the soldiers and the temple police took him and made him their prisoner. When the disciples saw what was happening, they asked, Lord, should we fight them with our swords? Before Jesus could answer, Peter pulled out his sword and swung at the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Stop, Jesus said. Put your sword back in its case, for all those who take up the sword will perish by the sword. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Don't you know that I could ask my Father to send a whole army of angels to help and protect me, and he would send them at once? But then how would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say that all that is happening is part of God's plan? And he touched the servant's ear and healed it. Then Jesus turned to the chief priests and the other leaders in the crowd and said, Did you have to come out here with swords and clubs to capture me, as if I was a terrorist or revolutionary? I was with you day after day teaching in the temple. You never raised a hand against me. But this is your hour, the hour when the part power of darkness is in charge. All this has happened that the words of the prophets in the scriptures might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. And there was one young man following Jesus who was only wearing a linen sheep, sheep wrapped around him. So when they tried to capture him, he slipped out of the sheep and ran away naked. Then the soldiers and the temple police tied Jesus' hands and led him away toward Jerusalem, where he would be put on trial for his life. They took him first to Annas, who was still called high priest, even though his son-in-law Caiaphas was now the real high priest. <coughs> Caiaphas, who was the one who at an earlier meeting of all the Jewish leaders, had told the people it would be good that one man should die for the people. 
a reading from our Lutheran confessions, excuse me, from the Passion History of Our Lord. Our second reading is from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 8 through 18. First he said, sacrifices and burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He set aside the first to establish the second, and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But when this priest had offered for all times one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. This is the word of the Lord. We rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 12th chapter, verses 28 through 37. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love the Lord, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandments greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no one other but him no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, how is it that the teachers of the law say, the Christ is the son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? The large crowd listened to him with delight. This too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my
Dear friends, grace, peace, and mercy be yours this evening and always from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this evening comes from the Gospel of Mark, the 12th chapter, and I want to read again for you a few verses. One of the teachers of the law came to Jesus and heard them debating. Notice that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, How is it the teachers of the law say that Christ is the son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? We all ask lots of questions in our lives, right? A lot of the questions that we ask every day or questions we're confronted with every day are more or less not that important, not real significant in the big scheme of things. Things like, what's for dinner? You want to go to the movie? What did you think about that baseball game? Are you going to watch the twins tomorrow? Want to go fishing? They might be important to us, but in the big scheme of things, questions like that come and go, not that big a deal, it's part of life. Now, there are questions that we encounter that are more significant though. Questions that, at least when it comes to life and our lives, hold some weight. Will you marry me? Big question. What do you think you're going to do with the rest of your life? Sort of a big question. Did you get the lab test back? What they say about the biopsy? Those are some important questions. Definitely more weighty than the first. Tonight, though, tonight we encounter two very weighty questions. Very significant questions. And as we talked last week and the week before, we're looking at these days during Holy Week that we don't pay a lot of attention to, that sort of get skipped over. But on those days, like every day of his ministry, like every day of his earthly life, Jesus was teaching us, proclaiming the good news, directing us to him and to his gospel. No different on this Tuesday of Holy Week. That's the night we're focusing on, the day we're focusing on this evening. Last week we talked on Monday of Holy Week how Jesus overturned the money changers in the temple and what he was doing there. Tonight we're focusing on Tuesday and our Lord's continued work and teaching for our salvation. Here we encounter two questions. One asked of the Lord, in which he answers, and one the Lord asks, both questions, teaching us significantly about our Lord and his gospel. Jesus was in the temple again. He was in the temple court a lot during Holy Week. It was Tuesday, and he had gone again to the temple to be among the people and to teach and to talk to people. He had got into a debate just previous to where our text picks up for this evening with the Sadducees. The Sadducees were one of the major denominations, if you will, or sects within Judaism at the time. They were the nobles, the wealthy, the aristocratic Jewish people, and they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. <coughs> They only followed the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah. Yet, they were on the Sanhedrin and they were influential people and had a lot of power. Jesus got into a debate with the Sadducees about marriage and the resurrection. You remember that. It's when he talks to them and they, they try to trap him and trick him by asking him a question about a man who had, uh, a woman who had several husbands or brothers, all, all brothers, and, and they asked Jesus, 
Who's going to be her husband in the resurrection? Who's she going to be married to in the resurrection? And Jesus points out to them. Now this might come as good news or bad news, depending on your perspective. You won't be married in the resurrection. Your spouse isn't going to be your spouse in the way that your spouse is your spouse here. That was a mouthful. You know what I mean. Okay? Jesus points that out, that there's not marriage at the resurrection. There's not that kind of relationship. We will all love each other and be together. But that's not the case in the resurrection as far as marriage. And so he, he turns the question back on the Sadducees. And we're told as we pick up our text for this evening that one of the scribes, one of the rival denomination guys, one of the Pharisee types in that group, he was listening and he was satisfied with Jesus' answer. So now he comes and asks Jesus a question of his own. Doesn't seem to be trying to trick Jesus though. This doesn't seem to be a question with a bad motive. It just seems to be he answered those Sadducees pretty good. I want to see what he says about this. And so he goes to Jesus and he says, Teacher, what is the most important commandment? What is the greatest commandment? And here Jesus replies from Deuteronomy and from Leviticus that hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. So he starts his answer right out of scripture. Notice he doesn't say anything about, now this is what you do. When we hear commandments, we think that, don't we? We think this is something we're supposed to do or something we're not supposed to do. Something we have an obligation to carry out or something we have an obligation to refrain from doing. But Jesus doesn't start out that way. He starts out with a testimony from Deuteronomy, who the Lord is. The Lord your God is one. And then he says, you shall love the Lord your God with everything you have, with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul, with all your power. Jesus doesn't stop there, though. He goes on to quote Leviticus, I think chapter 6. He goes on to quote Leviticus, though, and say, but the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. These are the greatest of the commandments. And you realize that in answering that way, Jesus was summarizing the entire Ten Commandments. In other words, by saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, with all of you, Jesus was saying, remember the first three commandments. You shall have no other gods shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. The first table of the law as you're taught in catechism class, confirmation class. But think about that. If we could do that, we wouldn't need the Ten Commandments. If we could love God with everything we have, with our whole being, if we could fear, love, and trust in God above all things, that sounds familiar, then we wouldn't need to be told about the first commandment. We'd be doing it. We wouldn't need to be told not to misuse the Lord's name because we never would and we'd use it rightly. We wouldn't need to be told about remembering the Sabbath day, about not letting church get too long, about loving the word of God, about gladly hearing and learning it. The problem is we don't. We don't love the Lord our God with our all our heart, soul, mind, strength all the time, do we? We just don't. It's Lent so I can say these things. Right? We don't. So often the Lord isn't first in our lives. So often other things aren't. I don't need to go through that list again. You know what they are. And again, when the Lord says, love your neighbor as yourself, we know that he's talking about the other seven commandments, right? Because if we could truly 
always love our neighbors as ourselves, we wouldn't need to be told to honor our father and mother. We wouldn't need to be told not to murder or hurt or harm our neighbor in his body. We wouldn't need to be told to remain faithful to our marriage vows. We wouldn't need to be told not to take other people's stuff or try to trick them out of it. We wouldn't need to be told not to gossip about people or put people down to build ourselves up. We wouldn't need to be told not to want and covet what other people have and feel jealous that we don't have it and they do. Right? We wouldn't need any of that stuff. If we could just love our neighbors as ourselves, we'd be keeping the second table of the law too. But again, we fall short. We just do. We fall short in thought, word, and deed. But here's the good news. The good news that the question, the first question, points the people then to, the scribe and everybody who is listening, and all of us here this evening. The one who is the one God, the one who is God, the Lord your God is one, was standing right in front of the scribe. The one who created the heavens and the earth, the one who was God from all eternity, the one who with the Father and the Holy Spirit, the one God, created everything and gave life to everyone, was standing in front of the scribe that asked the question. And this one true God, here in flesh, would sacrifice everything for his people, for those whom he loved. Just as Jesus talks to the Father in Gethsemane and talks about the cup that he has to drink and first asks the Father if it can pass from him and then says, not my will, Father, but your will be done. That one, God and Savior, was standing in front of the Pharisee, the scribe, that asked that question. So even in responding to the question, Jesus is pointing the dear people to him and God's love. The Pharisee, the scribe, he was happy with that answer. He was happy with Jesus' answer because he's a scribe after all. He loves the law. He loves to know the law. But Jesus isn't going to leave him there. Jesus is going to point him where he needs to be pointed to. And he's going to keep this up. It's only Tuesday. He's going to drink the cup on Friday. But he wants everyone, before he does, to know who he is and why he came. And so in continuing this teaching on this Holy Tuesday, in order to continue this point that he'd been making in his answer to the previous question, Jesus asked those who are gathered around him, the Pharisees, the scribes, his disciples, those who were listening, he asked them, say on this topic, of the Messiah, why do you guys say that the Messiah, the Savior, is David's son? And what were they doing by holding to that? What were they trying to take away from who the Messiah really was by just calling him David's son in order to continue to point them to him and to who he truly was Jesus reminds them from Psalm 110 what the scriptures say about David's son. When we're told in Psalm 110 that David himself, as Jesus says to those listening, David himself says to the Lord, let my Lord sit at my right hand. David himself calls both the Father Lord and the Savior Lord pointing out that the Savior had to come in human flesh. He had to take on human flesh to be one of us, to be our substitute, to take our place under the wrath of God, under his own law, to be our Savior. 
here on this Holy Tuesday. Again, a day that we don't pay much attention to. We're going to spend three days this Lenten season talking about Tuesday. This is just the beginning. But here at the start, on this Holy Tuesday, when otherwise we'd be thinking straight to Monday Thursday, right? We'd be thinking about the passion of our Lord. Jesus is going about his business in the temple and amongst the people, teaching them about God, about the kingdom of God, and about who he is, proclaiming the gospel, pointing them back to scriptures that speak to him, and drawing all to him, who is the Savior, who is David's Lord, who is their Lord, who is the Savior of the world, who in just three short days from this evening that we're focusing on, would drink the cup that his father willed for him to drink so that he could be our Lord forever and we could be forgiven all our sins. In Jesus' name. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds forever in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.